Welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up for the week of 19 April 2020. Um, show news, zero-day extravaganzas, star bleed, Zoom just can't win, COVID-19 as ever, and um, is compliance really helping security? All this and more on the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. As technology continues to evolve and expand, so have the countless ways our critical systems can be put in jeopardy. Ransomware attacks, misconfiguration, user error, and malicious threat actors, to name a few. As IT infrastructures continue to grow and diversify, how do you ensure stable security? Core Security, a help systems company, provides an analytics-driven, layered approach to security with a portfolio that enables both proactive and reactive responses. With Core Security, you can reduce risk by limiting access, detect upcoming and active threats, test for security weaknesses, and efficiently monitor data for actionable insights. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Hi, I'm, I'm Doug White. My video is lagging today. From Roger Williams University, your host, and welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up Show in the time of plague. First, let's wrap the show topics for this week. Uh, on Application Security Weekly number 104, Mike, Matt, and John had an interview with Rebecca Deck from Avalara. Uh, this interview was about how you can check all the boxes and have a great looking AppSec system, but not have any real positive results. Um, I assure you, I audited places that could check every box and put a ribbon around it and do all that stuff they talk about in compliance. And they just, their security was just a, a joke, but the boxes were checked. So this is a really uh, useful interview, I think, for everyone right about now when we're all concerned about uh, compliance. And there's several news stories this week about compliance as well. On Business Security Weekly, number 170, Paul, Jason, and Matt interviewed Summer Craze Fowler, the CIO at Argo AI, about the InfoSec World Conference in Orlando in June. Uh, InfoSec World is always a fun conference at Disney. Uh, it's, it's scheduled for June now, so uh, we'll see how that goes, but definitely check out. Uh, they were talking about some of the things that they're planning to have at InfoSec World. On Enterprise Security Weekly number 180, Matt and Paul had an interview with Peter uh, Wormka, who is uh, a former senior intelligence officer with the CIA. So that's pretty cool. Um, they were talking about this article called uh, LinkedIn Cybersecurity Recruitment by Hostile Intelligence Agencies. And uh, it sounds like a Tom Clancy novel, but it's not. And it was really interesting to, to hear uh, what Peter had to say about uh, how some of these hostile foreign entities are recruiting, you know, entry level security professionals and, and experienced security professionals using the LinkedIn platform. Um, I, I thought. Uh, in a second segment, Mark Orsi, uh, the president of Global Resilience Found, uh, Federation, I always say foundation for some reason, the Global Resilience Federation, talked about the business impacts and security risks associated with remote work. Again, it's a very timely segment. All of us, I was on a conference call for uh, an hour and a half earlier with a bunch of different companies where we were talking about, you know, how are we dealing with this, all these different issues about everyone getting their dream come true of working from home and finding out that it's not always uh, a dream come true. Uh, very timely thing to check out. On Security Weekly News number 27, Jason Wood talked about the uptick in security threats related to COVID-19, which is definitely something we've been seeing a lot of uh, targeting. And again, there are news stories about that all week. 
On Security and Compliance Weekly number 25, uh, Jeff, Matt, Josh, and Scott interviewed none other than Paul Asadori and the grand, grand pimp meister of Security Weekly himself. Paul talked about his history with gangster rap in the 90s and the founding of 9mm Records during his time in Los Angeles. But seriously, uh, it's always fun to hear Paul talk about Security Weekly with, uh, on one of the shows. Uh, so it was a great chance to hear what Paul had to say about Security and Compliance Weekly and how it fits into the Security Weekly profile and uh, just a lot of other fun stuff. So definitely worth uh, watching an interview with Paul. You know, there's not many of those, really. Uh, he's usually the interviewer. Uh, and finally, on Paul Security Weekly number 648 last night, uh, mo the Mostly Remote crew uh, interviewed Ori Zigandari and Patrick Laverty, who I always I always say his last name wrong. I don't know why I know his last name. Patrick, I know your last name. Um, but I, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, about they were talking about the Layer 8 conference. And if you haven't been to the Layer 8 conference yet, that con primarily focuses on social engineering and OSINT topics. And they also have this thing called Workshop Con. It's a very cool, uh, like a local conference. And you can always check it out. They, they have a lot of uh, Security Weekly involvement in that conference. Usually some of the hosts, if not uh, uh, quite a few of them, are usually around. Uh, but you can check out uh, all the information about that conference at layer8conference.com. A second interview with Stephen Bay, uh, who's the director of security operations uh, at Security On Demand now and was a former NSA contractor. And I know I've talked about this, this interview before, uh, because if you don't know who um, Stephen Bay is, he was the person at NSA who hired Edward Snowden. And he was the manager of Edward Snowden when he decided to walk off with all the goods in Hawaii. If you've seen the movie or obviously you've, you've read up on this. Um, definitely always worth watching uh, this interview. This was originally aired on Enterprise Security Weekly, which was where I reported on it before. But if you didn't get a chance to catch it before, they re-aired it on Pulse Security Weekly last night. So that was pretty fun. Uh, I was again drinking Odaja cognac and uh, talking to everybody on the back channel during a, a fun show uh, last night. My favorite threat of the week is going to have to continue. I, I mean, it, it's it's really still remote compliance, but I'm going to actually say the threat of the week is probably COVID hackers. Um, it's still just remote compliance issues, but it really seems that COVID and the pandemic and the shutdown in addition to just sending everyone home, has allowed a lot of these sort of utility framework type companies now to redirect all their targeting at uh, various components of COVID-19, whether it is about targeting hospitals. Uh, so there's a lot of stories about that this week, about different hospital and, and healthcare systems being targeted by both uh, foreign and domestic uh, hacking groups and, and nation states uh, targeting health care, targeting everything from phishing uh, with people trying to get their unemployment checks. Uh, so there's been a lot of that kind of phishing to denial of service attacks on hospitals and other networks that were trying to disseminate information to phishing people over their stimulus checks and on and on and on and on. And to which was going on on you know on college and high school and grammar school campuses and corporate offices. Uh, I've heard numerous reports of people saying, "Yeah, we got Zoom bomb, blah blah blah." Uh, credential harvesting from all those kind of things, as well as just from OSINT credential harvesting, uh, social engineering credential harvesting, and on and on and on. And it all basically adds up to some truly reprehensible behavior. I do think some of it's nation state driven chaos. So it is foreign actors who are trying to create a state of chaos. Um, but some of it's just good old fashioned scum of the earth people. So there are people who for as long as there have been people around, there have been people who go around and steal people's life savings through con games and, and you know whatever. And so basically there's people who just don't have that level of empathy that says, wow, it's really sad when this old person gets taken advantage of. And they are heavily targeting uh, older people who don't know as much about technology, older users who have suddenly been forced to do remotes. 
and they're really after all this and everybody's worried about money and all these other kind of things. So, you know, add all that to the to just the general stupidity that's going on, the refusal to acknowledge science, uh, and it's just this big giant cesspool of disaster. There was some good news uh, this week in that the Cyber Justice League, which is an invitation only group, uh, I think they send out invitations by OWL or something, and mine hasn't gotten here yet, but um, they've been working to support the healthcare system, good job, uh, since March, and uh, the more than 1,400 vetted members are now working for them. Uh, they have already taken down 2,800 or so cyber criminal assets. So good job, Cyber Justice League. Uh, I do want to say this, and I'm going to say it, and, and again, no politics involved. Uh, this is not a political show. Do not inject disinfectants, okay? Just do not do it. Uh, I don't care who told you it was a good thing. I don't care what you read. Don't inject disinfectants. I mean, seriously. Uh, and truthfully, you shouldn't be injecting anything unless your doctor told you to do so. But for God's sake, don't inject disinfectant or drink bleach. I don't care what I, I don't, I, you know, damn, like I, I was reading all these stories about people, you know, they got these miracle cures that involve bleach that were killing people. They, you know, you got people saying, oh, you know, shoot yourself up with something like, really? Are you insane? All right. Enough of that. Uh, top news from all the shows. Well, it was another tough week for Zoom. Uh, even though they started addressing a lot of their security flaws and have been a very, very responsive organization to dealing with the security flaws that have all come to light in the last few weeks, as, as you know, their, their user base went through the roof, Zoom did release uh, Zoom 5.0 this week. They added more improvements, more fixes. Uh, my only gripe is they keep adding all these features and I don't know about them. And then when I have to do a Zoom meeting, I haven't turned the features on. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I didn't even know those features have been added. I guess I should be looking at that more carefully. Uh, but despite all that, the bad press and, and the sort of ubiquitous term now, Zoom bombing, which, you know, that's not the kind of brand identification you want. I mean, Zoom bombing has become a term for any sort of, of mischief involving any platform but uh, it's got their name tied to it. So that's gonna be a tough one to shake. This has pushed some large organizations to walk away from the platform. I did a story last week about how the Taiwanese government had banned the use of Zoom because some of their content was being sent through Beijing. Uh, this week, numerous other large uh, organizations like Daimler-Benz had, had walked away and, and barred the use of this platform. Cisco uh, started up the ante by offering a more comprehensive free version of WebEx, and uh, you know, Zoom continues to be haunted by the Zoom bombing tag, despite the fact that I don't you know, personally think that Zoom was, was any worse than anything else after they did all their fixes. But uh, most of the problems that they're having are, are caused by poor configuration, just like a lot of stuff. Um, one of the articles last night on Pulse Security Weekly, uh, and I put a link to that, had a Yara rule, which would allow you to search for open Zoom meetings. And I saw a presentation on Wednesday where the presenter was able to compromise Zoom meetings just by simply shifting the URLs around uh, and guessing what the rest of them were or by, by scraping uh, you know, a consistent pattern to the URLs. So, and, and then I've also seen some Selenium scripts and other things that go out and scan for this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of focus on uh, compromising Zoom meetings and not very many people are doing it well. I mean, even at the, at the compliance IT level, there seem to be some issues with getting, you know, good rules in place and so forth. Um, you know, so poor, just like always, poor config, uh, uneducated users, lack of local policies that needed to be put together quickly, and suddenly, you know, you've got the name Zoom bombing hung on you forever, and it's tough to shake. There is an article here that evaluates the security of major video platforms. You do have to register to read it. I put it on there. Uh, it was the, they evaluated the top eight major video platforms for security. You do have to register to read it, but you know what to do with that. Um, ZecOps blog this week discussed a vulnerability that would allow remote code execution and remote uh, infections in iOS since version six. Um, 
it's basically a pair of out of bounds and heap uh, overflow errors that are triggered by malformed emails. So this is called a zero click uh, attack, meaning that they can send you this email and when you uh, when the email arrives, so it's not actually when you open the email, it's when the email arrives, a malformed email uh, traffic and the fetch process. So this is just the uh, device itself going out to get the email triggers this uh, this heap overflow and the other out of bounds error. These two exploits then combine with a kernel level security hole exploit, which has been around and can be used to escalate the attack. So iOS, uh, if you didn't know, pushed out a beta version 13.4.5, which fixes both these flaws. But if you're using an older device or you're using, you know, that can't be updated to a current version of iOS, and there's a lot of people doing that, or you haven't updated to this beta, um, you do have this flaw and you could conceivably receive this uh, remote code execution and or infection email uh, on your iOS device. Um, apparently this was primarily being used by nation states to target high profile targets. So it was, it was about VIP targeting. It was also a week of apparently a lot of zero days being released, which is an unusual thing anymore. I mean, you don't see this many zero days all of a sudden. Larry put up a series of stories on Security Weekly Wiki last night, so if you want to see all those, you can. Um, he did have the iOS uh, zero-click uh, vulnerability I just talked about. Uh, he also had an Android Bluetooth zero-day that's called Blue Frag. And, and and this one is the one that really bugs me. Uh, there were four IBM Zero Days in their data risk manager platform. So this is one of their risk management security systems that apparently IBM refused to patch. Now I don't think that w I, when the story says IBM refused, I don't think they mean that IBM you know like put out a policy statement about it. It looked like what happened was the person reported it through the official cert process with IBM and the the process <clears throat> which was really looks like kind of lame then basically said he wasn't eligible to participate in this process and so whoever the developer was released it in the wild they just said well if you won't fix it I, I tried to do the right thing I tried to tell you about it and you you basically send me this crap and say oh gee uh, we're not going to fix this because you're not eligible to participate. And so they put them on GitHub. Um, it was very frustrating to me when I see stuff like this. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a report of a zero day is being is defined as, and here's what it said, and he had a copy of the email in this article. It was defined as out of scope. You know, I'm like, okay, you have four zero days in your risk management platform, but it's out of scope. And I guess he wasn't eligible to participate in the reporting program for, and you can read all that if you want to. So basically, yet again, a company refused to listen to someone who was trying to help them and do the right thing. And then since they refused, uh, basically the vulnerabilities were released on GitHub. Uh, so this is a lot like Mimi Cats. But hey, it keeps the lawyers implored, implored, employed. I implore you to stay employed. Um, Starbleed, uh, a vulnerability in field programmable gate array chips, so these are called FP FPGA chips, uh, may allow attackers to access programming components of those chips. The Horst Goetz Institute for IT Security at Ruhr Universität Bochum and Max Planck Institute for in Security and Privacy found a flaw um, in these Silinx chips that will allow you to take complete control of the chip if you can get access to it. So there's a, sort of a caveat there. Now there was an implication that there might be a remote method to do this. The chips are used in all kinds of industrial control systems, medical equipment, HVAC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and are designed to be, once they're put into boards and things, to be custom configured on site. And so they have a programming interface, which is sometimes called JTAG, that's one type of it. And this can be compromised, which would allow the attacker to modify the programming on the chip. It's kind of sophisticated. Uh, the primary focus of this attack was on Silinx uh, 7 series chips, and the flaw is included in Spartan, Kintax, Artix, and Vertix, as well as some older Vertix chips. The new chips that Silinx makes, which are called UltraScale and UltraScale Plus, are apparently not vulnerable. Silink said that it required close physical access to the chip, 
which meant that there's if you've got that and I've been I've been saying that too for years if if people can actually put their hands on devices the physical security is compromised and you have a lot of other problems at that point a global study of 750 IT decision makers conducted by Vance and Born for Tanium found that regardless of the spending level endpoint visibility remained about the same and it was it was both a major compliance and a cybersecurity issue no matter how much money they spent this story was uh, there was another story that was on security weekly this week about audits don't solve uh, security uh, basically and, and I put both those stories up it basically reinforces the whole idea of two things one that you can't just tick boxes in an audit and expect to have an actual security plan and two that you can't rely on the rear view mirror uh, analysis to actually make your system secure because things are just constantly shifting in the world and compliance is a great deal of trouble keeping up with those shifts in the world um, there's a couple of good stories that were the both these were on security and compliance weekly uh, so if you want to check that out on the wiki uh, and i put them on my wiki as well so if you want to read them uh, you can certainly uh, take a look and finally if you want to hack an Air Force satellite, and I mean, who doesn't want to do that? Well, now's your chance, legally. Um, the Space Security Challenge 2020, which is at the website hackasat.com, so I put a link on the wiki, uh, starts in about 28 days, I think. Uh, I, I, it was There was a countdown on there, and I think it was 28 days and 10 hours when I was looking at it this morning. Uh, and, and they're running a CTF, which will allow you to hack a satellite. So this is apparently there are ties into DEF CON 28, which so far is not canceled. Uh, and we all know that joke. Uh, but they had 10 $15,000 prizes. And I guess the CTF starts on May 22nd and runs through May 24th. And you do have to register and be ad admitted to the challenge. So don't just go hack any old satellite that you see. Uh, but you need to get involved in that. Uh, you could certainly win $15,000, which would more than pay for your trip to DEF CON 28, where they had another whole section of cash prizes in something called Event 2. So if you're planning to go to DEF CON, want to go to DEF CON, I would say $15,000 would at least you know, get you in the door, and you could probably have a pretty good time. At least I could. So if you're interested, and if you, you know, if you want to take me along with your $15,000 prize, that's fine. Uh, so if you're interested in your team taking this on, check it out at that site. And that is the news wrap up for the week of 19 April 2020 in the time of plague. Please don't drink bleach or inject yourself with disinfectant or huff it or anything else that I guess you could do with bleach or Lysol. Uh, I'm Doug White from the always online cybersecurity program at Roger Williams University. We'll see you next week on the network that never shuts down Security Weekly. Read the science and stay safe.